السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم اهدي قلبي وسدد لساني واسلل سخيمة قلبي أمين يا رب العالمين رمضان is a blessing, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It is a month that is blessed, that brings with it many blessings and its worship, meaning worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this blessed month is a means of purification and it is also a means of growth. It is something that increases us in our iman, it increases us in our good deeds, it increases us in our worship, in our inner strength. And the worship of this month is also a means of forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to make the most of this month. And may this month really be a means of purification and increase in rewards for all of us. Ameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ amanu. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That all oh, you who have believed, fasting has been prescribed upon you, meaning this is something that is mandatory on you, you have to do this, just as it was prescribed on those who came before you. And why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to observe fasts? It is لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ In order that you may develop taqwa, in order that you may safeguard yourselves, in order that you may be saved. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a very clear reason, a very clear objective, a very clear goal as to why He has obligated us to fast. And within these verses, within this passage, we learn that شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنَ That it is the month of Ramadan in which the Qur'an was revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions certain qualities of the Qur'an. And then he says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ That whoever witnesses that month among you, meaning whoever is alive at that time, Whoever lives through the month of Ramadan, then what should they do? فَلْيَصُمْهُ Then he should fast during that month. So fasting, which is obligatory, as we know, is in the month of Ramadan. But this fasting is for a reason. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that reason. And, you know, if you think about it, a lot of times, especially when it comes to our habits or the rules that we make related to our food consumption, You know, we have certain goals. For example, we want to eat a certain way so that we are healthier, right? People practice intermittent fasting. Why? Because they want to be able to reap certain benefits. So, you know, there's always some reason why you would change your diet, why you would change your eating habits, and why you would observe certain practices in your life. And when it comes to fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, the goal, the reason. And that reason is لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ And this is so powerful. Because when we remember the goal, when we have an objective, we are able to work backwards from that. We are able to keep that you know, in front of us and that goal becomes a source of motivation for us. And also it is something that gives us an encouragement as to why we should be doing what we are doing. So fasting is not to make us hungry. Fasting is not to torture us. Fasting is not to make our life difficult for us. No, fasting is for a very beneficial reason, something that we are all in desperate need of, and that is taqwa. Now, what is the word tattaqun? What is this concept of taqwa? Taqwa is basically to preserve or guard oneself. But it is not just to preserve and guard oneself a little bit. It is to, you know, exceedingly guard oneself, to take serious measures in order to protect oneself. So for example, 
you know, when it comes to the winter, where I live in the winter, it can get extremely cold. So sometimes, you know, you can't just walk outside with a jacket. A jacket alone will not be sufficient. You have to make sure that you are wearing a hat that will keep your ears warm, that will keep your head warm. You have to make sure that you're wearing gloves so that your fingertips also stay warm. Otherwise, you could get, you know, extremely cold. You could get a frostbite. So that could be extremely dangerous. So tattaqoon taqwa is to guard oneself exceedingly. You need to extraordinarily protect oneself, preserve oneself. And you do that, how? By putting a shield between yourself and what could be potentially dangerous for you. You put a barrier between yourself and what is potentially harmful for you. So, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ What does this mean? This means, first of all, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed fasting upon us in order that we may save ourselves. Meaning, fasting is meant to save us. How is it supposed to save us? What exactly is it rescuing us from? What exactly is it shielding us from? You see, every single day, we make mistakes. Some mistakes we realize, other mistakes we don't even realize. And the kind of mistakes that we make are so different, right? Sometimes we have, you know, bad intentions. We have the intention to hurt someone. You know, sometimes we may make a mistake in the way that we're talking, that we say something rude that really hurts someone, right? When we're praying salah, we're not focused. When we're thinking about our situation, we can become extremely negative. Sometimes, you know, the way that our children behave or the way that our spouse is treating us, sometimes we can get really angry. And we begin to, you know, show that anger and start, you know, saying things which are inappropriate. Sometimes, you know, we realize the mistakes that we have made and other times we don't realize the mistakes that we have made. How often it happens that, you know, in casual conversation, you catch yourself backbiting, right? You have that realization that this might be riba. Or you catch yourself, you find yourself making fun of someone. And making fun of someone is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden us from. So the fact is that because we are human beings, because we are not perfect, because we forget, because we are weak, we keep making mistakes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that He has obligated us to fast for this entire month. Why? So that the day-long worship becomes a means of purification for us. Because you see, when you pray salah, how long do you pray for? Maybe five minutes, maximum 10 minutes. But when you are fasting, you are fasting from suhoor all the way until iftar. So every single moment that you spend fasting is a moment that is recorded as ibadah. So imagine you are worshiping all day long. So by increasing the duration of this act of worship, what is happening by default is that our sins are getting erased. Because we learn a very beautiful principle in the Qur'an that إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ That indeed good deeds erase bad deeds. So by obligating us to fast, what's happening is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saving us, right? He is protecting us from what? From the punishment of our own sins by purifying us. And this is one of the goals, one of the objectives of fasting in the month of Ramadan. We learn in a hadith that once the Prophet ﷺ ascended the mimbar, and he said, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. And the companions were surprised, so they asked him wasallam, as to why he said that. And he explained that Jibreel came to him, and Jibreel said that, مَنْ أَدْرَكَ شَهْرَ رَمَضَانَ فَمَاتَ فَلَمْ يُغْفَرُ لَهُ فَأُدْخِلَ النَّارُ فَأَبْعَدَهُ اللَّهِ That the person who finds the month of Ramadan, and he dies without being forgiven, and he ends up in hellfire because of the fact that he was not forgiven, because he still had all of his sins with him, then may Allah remove him far away, meaning may Allah curse him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ameen. 
So this shows us that one of the goals of Ramadan is to cause us to be forgiven. And how is it that we can earn forgiveness through the month of Ramadan? Inshallah, we will discuss that. So لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ First of all means so that you are saved, meaning you are saved from the punishment of your sins. Secondly, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ also means that you all guard yourselves, meaning you become more conscious. Why? Because when we are fasting, essentially we're practicing restraint, right? We're constantly controlling ourselves. We're constantly saying no to ourselves. We are very alert in the sense that we are keeping an eye on ourselves. We are monitoring ourselves, right? That can't eat this, can't eat that, can't even drink, right? Even when you are rinsing your mouth when making wudu, you're so careful to make sure that you don't swallow anything by accident. When you're cooking food and you want to, you know, just taste to make sure you put the salt in, and, you know, although it is allowed to just taste the food and then spit out anything that remains in the mouth, you know, again, you're so conscious, you're so careful that you don't want to accidentally swallow anything. So basically, while you're fasting, you are monitoring yourself. You are keeping a check on yourself. And you are keeping a check on yourself in private and in public, whether you are in front of people or you are alone at home. So what happens is that through fasting, you become more conscious, you become more alert, you develop the habit of self-monitoring, you know, observing your behaviors, observing your actions, and then controlling yourself. And this is something extremely important, you know, for self-awareness. You know, a lot of times when people go for therapy for their, you know, mental health issues, a lot of times, you know, the therapist begins with telling the patient to self-monitor certain behaviors and certain, you know, patterns of self-talk because the first step towards healing is to become self-aware, right? The first step towards improvement is that you are able to recognize yourself. So fasting helps us be more alert and be more conscious. And that is essential for being able to avoid sins. And then thirdly, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ also means that you become more righteous. You become more pious. Why? Because while you're fasting, of course, you're not going to be able to eat and drink. And you know that it's the month of Ramadan, you should be doing good things. So the kind of things that you don't do in general, right? The kind of good deeds that you tend to delay, Throughout the year, in the month of Ramadan, you become more consistent. Like for example, for a lot of people, reciting Qur'an every single day is a struggle. But in the month of Ramadan, they have that motivation that, you know what, let me recite a little bit. Let me recite a little bit more. I have to recite the entire Qur'an once, at least. Or I have to do it three times, five times. Or at least I should be able to recite half of it. Right? Whatever your goal is. And likewise, when it comes to, you know, giving sadaqah, giving charity, we know that we should be giving it. But throughout the year, we kind of become lazy. But in the month of Ramadan, because we are more eager to earn rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we develop the habit of giving charity. So the month of Ramadan, you know, fasting in the month of Ramadan, this is for our own benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from the consequences of our sins through the exercise of fasting we become more self-aware, we develop the habit of self-monitoring, and also we develop good habits. We develop the ability to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. So, لَعَلَّكُمْ تتقون, This is the goal. This is the benefit. This is the purpose. Now, when it comes to taqwa, that لَعَلَّكُمْ تتقون, So that you develop taqwa, you become more conscious, you safeguard yourselves, you become more pious. Now, this is something that is essential for all of us. You know, taqwa is not just for people who are very righteous, people who are from very religious families, or people who, you know, have memorized the entire Quran. Taqwa is essential for every single one of us. We learn in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ وَصَّيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ 
وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنْ اتَّقُوا الله. That certainly we instructed the people who came before you, the people of the book before you, and we have also instructed you that all of you should observe taqwa of Allah. All of you should be more conscious of Allah. So taqwa is not just for certain people. Taqwa is relevant to all of us. Every single one of us can become better at self-monitoring, at thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more, right? At striving to earn the rewards of Allah and striving to stay away from disobedience to Allah. So this is something that, you know, is relevant to every single one of us. And when it comes to taqwa, remember that taqwa is a source of a lot of good. Yani when you become more self-aware, when you become more conscious of Allah, when, you know, there is purification, then this is something that is a source of great benefit for all of us. We learn in the Qur'an that وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever has taqwa of Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a way out for him, meaning from his difficulty. وَيَرْزُقُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And then Allah provides for that person from where that person does not even expect. And that person never imagined that they could get some benefit from a certain place, from a certain opportunity, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends sustenance to them from that place. So it is extremely beneficial for us. Now the question is that how can we make sure that we are actually developing taqwa in the month of Ramadan? That the worship we perform in the month of Ramadan truly is a source of purification for us. And it really helps us increase in our rewards. And it really helps us become more self-aware, more conscious, and you know, conscious of Allah. What can we do? So I want to talk about five things right now. The five things that can help us, you know, have a successful Ramadan, inshallah. And these five things are, first of all, sincerity. It is very, very important that we remind ourselves to be sincere every single day of Ramadan. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever fasts in the month of Ramadan, imanan wahtisaban, with faith and with expectation of reward, then all of his sins will be forgiven. And in another hadith, we learned that whoever prays in the nights of Ramadan, Again, with faith and with expectation of reward, then all of his sins will be forgiven. So in both of these statements, we learn that a person can truly benefit from their fasting and their night worship when they do these things with faith and with expectation of reward. Now, what does this mean with faith? Meaning with faith in Allah, you believe in Allah, you do this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An expectation of reward that you expect reward from Allah, not from people. Not that people should pity you or that people should, you know, give you generous gifts or that, you know, they should treat you extra special. You're doing this for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. So it's incredibly important that we remind ourselves now that as we enter the month of Ramadan, let us do what we do with sincerity. And every single thing that we do in the month of Ramadan, whether it is that we are fasting, or it is that we are reciting Qur'an, or that we are sending gifts to our loved ones, we are giving donation, we are spending in charity, we are sending iftar, we are sponsoring iftar. You know, we are being easy with our servants, that we give them, uh, you know, extra time off, or we relieve them off, you know, extra work, and things like that. Let us expect reward from who? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learn in Surah Al-Layl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَيُجَنَّبُهَا الْأَتْقَى That the person who has most taqwa, the person who is very conscious of Allah, then such a person will be saved from the hellfire. And who is this person who is very conscious of Allah? الَّذِي يُؤْتِي مَا لَهُ يَتَزَكَّى The one who gives his wealth, meaning the one who gives in charity, why? To purify himself. وَمَا لِأَحَدٍ عِنْدَهُ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ تُجْزَى Not to return a favor or to give a favor so that he is repaid. No, he doesn't expect anything from people. Why is he giving charity? Why is she giving charity then? She is giving it إِلَّا بَتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِ الْأَعْلَى Only to seek the face of his Lord, the exalted, the highest. 
وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى And surely he shall be pleased. Meaning when you do something exclusively for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is how you earn the pleasure of Allah. But when our intention is corrupt, and how do we know that our intention is corrupt? That we are expecting praise from people. We are expecting some kind of, you know, reciprocation from people, some kind of acknowledgement from people. Or we want to make sure that they recognize our effort in one way or another by sending a thank you message, right? And things like that. Then this shows that the intention was a little problematic. So in the month of Ramadan, whatever we are doing, let us make sure that we're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to help yourself, remember this, you can write these two words for yourself, imanan wahtisaban. Right, you can write these words down for yourself and maybe, you know, put them in, you know, in front of your desk, wherever that you spend a lot of time, maybe on the refrigerator, right? Maybe on your phone as a screensaver, something. Why? So that you remember that this is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imanan wahtisaban. The second thing that we can do, inshallah, to really reap the benefits of the month of Ramadan, to make sure that we are able to develop taqwa, the month of Ramadan is a source of purification for us, we truly do become more conscious, is that we should increase in our worship. Any, the month of Ramadan is not just about fasting, right? Fasting is the bare minimum. And what I mean by that is, that your goal should not just be to somehow survive until you can eat again. So you wake up, you eat, you pray, you sleep. And then you wake up, you pray, you just lie down. You pray and then you get up again, you pray and then you just laze around, right? You just spend several hours on your phone or that you watch something. Maybe you go out, you know, shopping, whatever, and you do chores around the house to kind of kill time until you can eat again. You know, fasting is a bare minimum. What we need to do is that while we are fasting, we should also increase in other acts of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ عَبُدُوا رَبَّكُمْ أَلَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That all people worship your Lord, who has created you and who also created the people before you, why should you worship your Lord? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ In order that you may become more conscious, in order that you are saved. Right? Same word has been repeated over there. So absolutely, fasting is an act of worship. But along with that, let us pay attention to our salah, praying on time, praying in the best way, praying voluntary prayer, nafil prayer, making sure that we're performing our sunnah prayers, making sure that we are, you know, increasing in our dhikr, making sure that we are giving sadaqah, right? Every single day, some kind of charity. Why? Because this is something that will make the fast more beneficial. It will make the rewards of the fast even more, right? It will multiply the rewards of the fast because you are already in a state of worship and then you are performing even more worship. And we see this in the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, you know, for example, in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, he would perform i'tikaf, right? He would stay in the masjid. Why? What is i'tikaf all about? That you are staying in the masjid, you're not going anywhere else. You're staying in the masjid. Why? So that you can worship Allah, you know, all the time, basically. The only time when you're not actively engaged in your ibadah is when you are resting or when you are, you know, eating, etc. But otherwise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would do i'tikaf for the reason that he could perform more worship. So let us think about, you know, what we can do. And each person's situation is different, right? Some people, because of their health, because of their, you know, family situation, they're not able to you know, spend a lot of time in ibadah. You know, they need to take rest. They need to look after their family. They have to go for work, etc. But along with that, actually, there's still something that we can do. For example, salah is something that you can't leave, whether you are unwell or you are at work or you are at home. Even when you're pregnant, right, you cannot leave your salah. You may not be fasting, but you still have to pray. So think about how you can improve your prayer. 
how you can recite just a little bit of more Qur'an in your salah, how you can make your rukur just slightly longer, right? How you can beautify your salah, pay a little bit more attention, not rush through the salah. So every person, you know, their situation is different. And it's very important that we don't compare ourselves to others. Rather, we should recognize our, uh, you know, circumstances and see what am I able to do? What can I do? How can I improve my worship? Uh, for some people, uh, this means reciting a lot of Quran. For other people, this means, you know, uh, praying a lot of nafil prayers. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with wealth, then think about how you can give charity on a regular basis. Because that is also a form of worship. In a hadith, we learn that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once sitting in the shade of the Kaaba. And he was saying, they are the greatest losers by the Lord of the Karba. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ was swearing by Allah. He was taking an oath by Allah. And he was saying that those people are the greatest losers. So Abu Dhar anhu, you know, he was nearby and he got really worried. He thought, you know, what's wrong with me? Is, is he saying this about me? What did I do? And, you know, he felt really bad in his heart. And finally, he asked the Prophet ﷺ that, who are they? Who are you talking about? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Aktharuna Amwala. Those who have a lot of wealth, they're the ones who will be the greatest losers. Except for the one who does this and this and this. And the Prophet ﷺ, you know, pointed towards different directions, indicating that except for the one who is constantly spending in the way of Allah. And the thing is that, you know, if you have the privilege to use the internet at this moment, you have the privilege of, you know, having a smartphone or a computer, you know, and things like that. You have access to electricity, you have access to fresh water. All of these are actually privileges. So every single one of us has been blessed in one way or another. Being rich does not mean that you have millions of dollars sitting in your bank account. Being rich means that you have access to fresh water. You have, you know, all of the basic necessities. In fact, even extra things are, you know, extra luxuries are available to you. So Aisha radiallahu anha, when she gave sadaqa, we learn in one narration about how she only had three dates, Right, And she gave those to a woman who came knocking at her door with her two little girls. So she had that much food to give. So, you know, we do have a lot and we need to recognize that. Instead of, you know, self-pitying and comparing ourselves to other people that, you know, so-and-so has such a big house, so-and-so has such a nice car, so-and-so is always traveling the world. Right, so and so is now going out to eat over there and over there, and now they're wearing this, and now they have that bag, and now they have those shoes, and now they have, you know, three helpers, and now they even have a chauffeur, and things like that. And instead of comparing ourselves to other people, let us recognize the gifts that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us, and let us use those to benefit others, because this is a beautiful way of drawing close to Allah Azza wa Jal. This is, you know, a very effective way of being purified from our sins. So, so that's the second thing that we all can focus on. So first, sincerity. Second, worship. The third thing is that let us pay attention to guarding the tongue, guarding our tongues. And I would say also guarding our fingertips. Why? Because these days, a lot of times, you know, communication does not happen verbally. It happens over text messaging. Or it happens over, you know, comments and things like that. So let us pay attention to what we are saying, how we are talking, what we are expressing with our tongues and with our hands, you know, verbally or in writing. Because the Prophet ﷺ instructed us that when one of you is fasting, then they should refrain from indecent speech and also from quarreling. Meaning do not say bad, obscene, dirty things. And also do not argue, do not quarrel. And if somebody should fight with you, meaning if someone should argue with you, or if someone uses foul language with you, then you should say, I am fasting. Meaning you cannot allow yourself to say bad things with this tongue while you are fasting. 
In another hadith, we learn that whoever does not give up lying, right, and evil actions while fasting, then Allah is not in need of this person leaving his food and drink. The point of fasting is not just to avoid food and drink. The real goal of fasting is to avoid sins. So you have to, you know, really pay attention to yourself, inshallah. And this goal we can set for ourselves that I have to guard my tongue. And, you know, guarding your tongue begins at home. It begins at home. It begins with our family. Because we feel so comfortable with our family members, our siblings, our children, our spouse, that we don't feel bad saying certain things, you know, making fun of them, yelling at them, insulting them, criticizing them, and things like that. So guarding the tongue begins at home. So make sure that you don't use this tongue to hurt people, to offend them, to annoy them, and things like that. And we can only do that when our tongue is busy in doing good things. You know, for example, if you have spent 30 minutes reciting the Qur'an, then you will not have the strength to argue with someone. You're going to be a little tired. If you have a goal that I have to complete the recitation of two ajzat today, then again, you're not going to have you know, time to waste on your phone or just talk to people, you know, randomly. You have a goal that you want to complete, you know, a certain dhikr before sunset, before iftar. So you're going to be busy with that and you're not going to be able to criticize your family over every little thing. You're not going to be able to scold everyone. So the way that we guard our tongue when we're fasting is by keeping our tongue occupied with something more meaningful, with what is more beneficial. And that is the recitation of the Qur'an, the dhikr of Allah, etc. The fourth thing is that spend more time with the Book of Allah. Spend more time with the Qur'an. Why? Because the month of Ramadan is the month when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an. And this is what makes Ramadan special. This is what makes Ramadan different from the rest of the months. In fact, we learn in a hadith that all of the previous scriptures also, the previous books also, like the Zabud, the Inji, they were also revealed in the month of Ramadan. So we could have been instructed to fast any other time of the year, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the month of Ramadan for a reason. So we're supposed to spend time with the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan. And when we look at the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we learned that in the nights of Ramadan, he would perform qiyam. And he encouraged us to perform qiyam. And in qiyam, essentially what we're doing is we're reciting the Qur'an or we are listening to it. The Prophet ﷺ would review the Qur'an with Jibreel every single month of Ramadan. So spend more time with the Book of Allah. So spending more time with the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan means that, you know, yes, we are reciting it, we are listening to it. We are also, you know, reviewing it. If you have memorized a certain portion of the Quran, Ramadan is an excellent time to review what you have memorized. Likewise, you can also spend more time with the Quran by reflecting on its meaning, by listening to a lecture in which, for example, you know, the verses of the Quran are being explained because the Quran is supposed to be acted upon, right? It is supposed to be followed. The Qur'an is supposed to be guidance. And the only way that we can, you know, follow the Qur'an is if we understand it. The only way that the Qur'an can be a source of healing for us and, you know, changing our behavior is that we understand and remember what the Qur'an is telling us. So you may know the meaning of the Qur'an. You may have even memorized it, but you may forget its teachings at a certain time, because as human beings, we forget. So, you know, there's so many programs that are offered by so many organizations, you know, especially in the month of Ramadan, where you get an opportunity to listen to the meaning of the Quran, or at least reflect over some verses of the Quran. So make sure that you sign up for something. Why? Because that will help you connect with the Quran every single day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهُ هُدَلِّ الْمُتَّقِينَ That this Qur'an is a guidance for those people who have taqwa. 
So if we want to increase in taqwa, then we have to spend time with the Book of Allah, inshallah. We have to increase our connection with the Qur'an. The last thing I want to talk about is dua. That in the month of Ramadan, we should especially be making dua in order to benefit from the fruits of this month. Meaning we should increase in calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, within the verses that talk about fasting and Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us that we should make dua to Him, right? That we should call upon Him. We should ask Him. And we learn in hadith also that the person who is fasting, when they break their fast and they call upon Allah at that time, that dua is accepted. We also learn that, you know, in the month of Ramadan, we are encouraged to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the night. And we learn that in the night, there is a special time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us, right? That who is there who will call upon me so that I will answer him? Who will ask me for something so that I will give him? Who will seek forgiveness from me so that I will forgive him? So, you know, we're up at night anyway. We have to break our fast anyway. So these are special moments, special times when we should be calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Asking Allah, Ya Allah, purify me. Ya Allah, forgive me for my sins. And any deficiencies that you recognize in yourself, any problems that you identify, you know, in your character, in the way that you talk, in your relationships, in, you know, the way that maybe you harbor grudges in your heart, or, you know, we recognize our faults, we recognize our weaknesses. And sometimes because of those weaknesses, you know, we tend to hate ourselves. So instead of you know, being angry with ourselves and being harsh with ourselves, let us channel that energy into calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, you help me become better. You forgive my sins. You purify me. Right? One of the du'as that we can make is, Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaha. That, O oh Allah, give my soul its taqwa. Grant my soul the taqwa, the consciousness that it needs. Allow me to shield myself from doing what displeases you. Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaha wa zakkiha. And oh my Lord, purify my soul. Anta khayru man zakaha. You are the best to purify it. Anta waliyuha wa maulaha. You are its protector and its guardian. I entirely depend on you. So ya Allah, you help me. So this is an excellent time to make dua, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us better human beings, to make us better worshippers, and to forgive us for all our shortcomings. Ameen. So these are the five things that I wanted to talk about. Inshallah, I can conclude over here. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. we have some questions regarding Ramadan. The first question is, what is the ruling if a person could not make a wake up for sahih? Okay, so the thing is that the fasting of Ramadan is an obligation. It's not an option. So if you end up missing your suhoor, then you still have to fast, right? If there's a few minutes left, you know, for example, you wake up three, four minutes before the fast begins, then you can eat something quickly, you can drink some water, etc. But if, let's say, you wake up 10 minutes after, you know, Fajr began, then the time's up, right? You can't eat anymore. However, you still have to fast. And it may be hard, but hopefully, inshallah, that should encourage you to become more careful and to wake up on time so that you can eat. Now, the thing is that for some people, you know, if they're fasting like that, I remember in the summer when we had to fast here in Canada, sometimes a fast would be like 18 hours. And in certain places, it's even longer. So, you know, if it happens one day, okay, if it happens like three, four days in a row, then and a person is about to fall unconscious, things like that, then if their health is really getting affected, then of course they can break their fast. But don't you know, refrain from fasting just because you missed your suhoor. Begin the fast and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you. And with the help of Allah, inshallah, you'll be able to complete the fast. If, however, you are falling ill, there's a, you know, serious concern about your health, your well-being, then in that case, you know, you can break your fast. But don't break your fast just because you're feeling tired or you're, you've got a headache. 
you know, go lie down, take some rest, take a nap, you know, help yourself in one way or another to make sure that you complete your fast. And if it's a serious health concern, then in that case, you can break the fast and then make up the fast after Ramadan, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, sister. Now we have next question. What are the recommended Tarawi namaz? Is it to eight or is it 20? Okay, so we learn in, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha reported that in the month of Ramadan and also otherwise, any throughout the year, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pray eight rakaat in qiyamul layl, meaning in the night worship, he would perform eight rakaat. So two, 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 two. All right, and then he would perform the witr. So this was his habit in Ramadan and also outside of Ramadan. So, you know, it's easy, it's doable, it's practical. You know, it's, for some people, just the thought of 20 rakaat is intimidating for them. It's a bit frightening for them. They wonder, how am I going to do this? And the eight rakaat, the Prophet wasallam used to do it, so it's easy to do it. But if, you know, for example, you have... You know, you're going, especially in a masjid, you know, they will do 20 rakat in many masajid. Why? Because 20 rakat helps, you know, people come anytime within that window and get at least eight rakat in. So for example, if someone comes in late, then they're not going to miss a lot. They will still be able to pray something. If someone has to leave early, again, they will be able to pray something. So in 20 rakat, there is convenience, absolutely. If you're praying on your own, eight should be the minimum. And of course, if you're not able to do eight at all, and you're really tired, then at least get two or four in. But remember that there is no number that the Prophet ﷺ specified. Meaning when he was asked about the night prayer, he said, pray it as two and two and two, meaning pray it in sets of two. He didn't say, pray 10 or pray 16, or pray 30, or pray 20, or only pray 8. He did not specify a number. He taught us the methodology, right? The way of performing the night prayer. And the number, you know, he left it open to us. And the thing is that, you know, some nights you have more energy, you can pray more. Some nights you don't, so you can pray less. But every single night, perform some qiyam at least, right? Something. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the ability to do. Inshallah. Wallahu a'lam. Jazakumullah khair. The next question is completing Quran along with reading its meaning once is better or committing two to three Quran is beneficial in Ramadan? So when it comes to the recitation of the Quran, of course, the more you do it, the more rewardable it is. So I would encourage you to do both. So for example, if you are able to, you know, recite easily a lot, then yes, recite three times the entire Quran, recite five times, whatever you are able to do. But along with that, spend maybe 10 minutes, 30 minutes a day, how much ever that you can do, but spend some time reflecting on the Quran as well. And you do both, okay? It's not either or, it's supposed to be both, all right? Inshallah. Wallahu a'lam. Jazakumullah The next question is, do we have to feed the poor for missed fast due breastfeeding or pregnancy if we couldn't make up before next Ramadan? So there is a difference of opinion in regard to this matter. Basically, the thing is that people who are not able to fast because of a temporary condition. A temporary condition is what? Like, for example, pregnancy, right? It's not an illness. It's not old age because of which you're not able to fast. It's a temporary condition because of which you're not able to fast. And in that case, you're supposed to make up the fasts, all right? You're supposed to make up the fasts. Now, there's a difference of opinion. Some say that, you know, only if a woman is able to make up those fasts, yes. And others say that, no, a woman who is pregnant who misses her fasts because of pregnancy, some sahaba actually said that she does not have to make up the fasts. So there is a difference of opinion. And I, I want you to recognize that, you know, as a woman, you know, someone who has children, and after researching this issue, also after consulting several scholars about this, well, what I have come to understand is 
that you make up the fasts before the next Ramadan. And if you're not able to make up the fasts before the next Ramadan, then you try to make them up the following year. But sometimes for some women, what happens is that one year they're pregnant, right? And they're not able to fast because they have extreme morning sickness, you know, weakness, etc. They're not able to fast. So one Ramadan, 30 days goes like that. Next Ramadan, what happens is that they're nursing. And because they're nursing, they're feeding their baby. You know, again, they're not able to fast. Uh, maybe they're able to fast a few days, but then, you know, they had their period for seven to 10 days. And then the other 20 days, they were not able to fast every day because they're nursing, right? So they don't have that much energy. It's affecting their milk supply. It's affecting the health of the child. So now the next Ramadan again, they weren't able to fast. What happens the following Ramadan? They're pregnant again. And then what happens the following Ramadan? They're nursing again. What happens the following Ramadan? They're pregnant again. You know, so by the time you realize that, okay, I really need to do something about this, you have almost a hundred fasts to make up. Now, when you have a hundred fasts or even more to make up, and then every Ramadan, you are not able to fast, you know, for seven to 10 days because of your cycle, the rest of the year, what are you going to do? Are you going to make up those seven to 10 fasts from the previous Ramadan? Or are you going to be worrying about, you know, making up those hundred missed fasts? So in this situation, it makes sense that the woman simply gives the fidya, right, for those hundred fasts or how many ever that she has. And, you know, later on, whenever she has the capacity, she can make up as many fasts as possible. But she's not required to give fidya every single year. No, you only give the fidya once for all of those fasts. And you make up, you know, the fasts that you missed because of your period. Those fasts, you absolutely have to make up. All right. But the fasts that you missed because of pregnancy, because of nursing, if you're able to make up, go ahead. And if you realize that over the years, they're just piling up, then give fidya, free yourself. And uh, later in life, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the tawfiq, try to fast as much as you can. And I've seen this in many women that, you know, in their younger years, while they're having children, then in that case, you know, they just give the fidya. And later on in life, you know, they're able to fast, mashallah, very regularly. And they, you know, make up as much as they can. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all tawfiq. Wallahu a'lam. And the next question is, uh, is it allowed to brush during fasting? Does this break the fast? Okay, brushing teeth is something that we should do while fasting. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would, you know, use the siwak a lot while fasting. The issue is the, the toothpaste. Are you allowed to use the toothpaste? So remember that even when it comes to a siwak, it has a certain flavor. Depending on what type of siwak you're using, it has a flavor. So having some flavor in your mouth does not break your fast, which is why, like I mentioned earlier, you are allowed to taste the food, but having, you know, a taste, having flavor in your mouth does not mean that you start to swallow it now. So what you should do is, you know, just as when you're doing the siwak, you spit it out. You know, any, any pieces of the siwak that break down in your mouth, you spit it out. So just like that, if you're using toothpaste, then use very, very little, a tiny amount, like literally a dot, and then make sure that you don't swallow any of it. All right? And then spit it out, rinse it out uh, to the best of your ability, and that is fine, inshallah. Wallahu a'lam. Jazakumullahu khayran kathira. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.